right, um, I'm Frank Kutka. I am one of the co-coordinators of the NPSAS Farm Breeding Club, and I'm going to describe what we've been doing with our SARE Research and Education Grant on uh, cover crops. Um, soil health has certainly been a, a, a big topic of discussion the last few years. It's always been very, very important, but it's very nice to see that people are actively interested in the topic in a big way these days. If you go to any of the various field days and demonstrations about soil health, you find that healthy soil, water soaks right in, it infiltrates. Unhealthy soil, water pools, and it runs off. If you ever see a slake test, a nice piece of dry, healthy soil put into water maintains its shape, even if it's wet. Unhealthy soil just dissolves, turns to mud doesn't stick together. Cover crops are one of many different tools available to help improve the health and maintain the health of soils. There's been a lot of discussion about cover crops all across the region the last few years. A lot of field days, demonstrations, and so forth, uh, especially of multi-species mixtures NPSAS got interested in this not only because of this uh, opportunity for sustainability, but also for the uh, seed selling opportunity. All of these cover crops are just going to be planted. No crop is harvested, so it's sort of a one-way trip for a lot of seed. It might be a great opportunity for folks who want to raise the seed to sell for other farmers to maintain their soils. One of the species that's of great interest in the area is uh, radish, especially daikon radish. Those are the radishes that make gigantic roots. This is a seedling with the characteristic heart-shaped cotyledons, so you can tell if you've planted radish that it's present. Uh, daikon radish moves right along. It starts to put out these pinnately compound leaves, kind of feathery and long. Eventually, it starts to grow a root, which is long and deep rather than round and red, and a rosette. So when you go in the field, it'll look a bit like this. So before they bolt, they just make this big flat plant with a big root underneath. The roots can look like so. And they will definitely crack and open the soil. They will help pull apart compacted zones to some degree. They pull up a lot of nitrogen and concentrate it into a form that will readily be released to the following crop. It's a very interesting cover crop species. But there have been some problems with seed. What could be the problem? Well, radish gets sold as radish, VNS, a lot of times. And something has happened. Folks have planted radish seed in their mixtures, and instead of finding great big daikon radishes, they found lots of little red cherry bell kind of radishes, because they're just sold as radish. It's the same species. And here's Jay Fuhrer giving a, a marvelous presentation. And in the background of this field, we've got all this radish flowering. Don't want radish flowering in your field, because if you leave it long enough, it'll go to seed, and now, now you've got a new weed species in your field. It's a great weed. So we don't really want it to do that. We decided we would try to find radishes that made big roots really fast and were late bloomers, not likely to go to seed in the wrong time frame. We did know that you could grow this plant, although it is a biennial. It's normally grown uh, where you plant it in uh, late June or early July. Let it make this great monstrous root, which you harvest and eat because it's actually a food crop. The following year, it would bloom. However, here, our winters are cold enough, it kills the radish out, so that doesn't work. But if you plant the radish very early in the growing season, there's enough cold for most varieties to actually bolt and produce seed later on the same year. Problem is trying to find those that don't bolt too early and we want those that will actually still make seed, because there are some that just really don't want to flower. So we were trying to find what would work, what would make a good root fast and flower at the right time so we could produce seed here and not have radish going to seed when it shouldn't. 
We've got uh, folks working in several different locations. Uh, South Dakota is where we got started. We've got a partner working with us in Wisconsin. And this summer, we will be partnering with some folks uh, planning some demos in the uh, early county area of central North Dakota. Emily Stiglmeyer got us started, uh, Selby, South Dakota. She grew 56 different varieties, which got rated for uh, how quickly they grew and how nice big roots they grew and planted late season. We especially liked eight. Uh, Emily's holding her very favorite one, which is an, a Nepalese version. Uh, daikon radishes from Asia, and actually the varieties we liked were mostly from Japan, India, and Pakistan, and Nepal. I've had some issues with radish, though. Here's uh, Stony Acres Farm CSA in Wisconsin, where the radish got increased. We've had some problems figuring out how to grow this plant and make selections the way we wanted to do it. Uh, the first time we planted them, we got these nice little roots because the plants were planted late, but we didn't find a way to easily store those over the winter. And root storage is a big deal if you're going to have a plant that's going to grow a great big root and then flower later. Because if you plant it in spring to get seed, you never see a big root develop. It just bolts right away. So how do you tell which one really does the whole thing? It has really been dogging us, trying to figure out which radish is going to work. But we have at least several varieties we know make roots at the right time. We took remnant seed of those. Katrina has increased those. So we've got a pound or two of that seed, which we're going to hope to increase further. So ongoing work with radish. First off, we want to figure out if we can actually store immature roots rather than fully mature roots and still plant them out the next spring so we can intermate selections the right way and make things move forward. Don't know if that'll work yet. Uh, this year, we'd like to do some variety demonstrations. So we will plant a, a group of different varieties in small strips uh, in Minokin. Perhaps we can find some other locations as well so that farmers can see the degree to which some of the varieties actually vary, because they do. Some are really quite impressively different. We're going to increase and do some initial selections with our new breeding population. I think it's got some real potential for growing big roots and improving the soil. And then field days, so farmers and gardeners can come see what we're doing and uh, see how the process works and take part, because what we're trying to find is a process that any of us can work with on farm to uh, not only grow the seed, but also continually improve it. All right, now I'm going to switch to our other cover crop species, because our project has two species to work with. Um, this one is one you, <clears throat> if you ask people about cow peas, a lot of times they'll tell you about these sort of hard ground green peas that you grow for feed. But that's not a cow pea. That's just a field pea. Cow pea is a different species, Vigna unguiculata. It's an African species, um, commonly grown in the south, uh, where it's called black-eyed peas, because their varieties frequently have little black eyes. Um, yeah, why don't you go ahead and pass that around. <clears throat> Cow pea looks like this out in the field. It's been a part of a lot of uh, mixtures because uh, cowpea is very drought tolerant and very heat tolerant. It doesn't really like cold very much, but if it's hot and dry, it's really what you want growing. The plants come up, they look like this, uh, pretty similar to most other um, legumes. And then they start to diverge a little bit. You can still tell this is related to a bean, but the plants a little bit funkier looking. Some of these are very compact and look like a nice bush bean, and some of them sort of range all over the place and doesn't quite look like a vine, but it doesn't look like any legume you've seen some days. But they are getting used in cover crop mixtures. Now, in places where it's really cold and they're going to be planted late, not so much, because uh, late planted cow pea, when the nights are really cold, they don't really do as well. But for things that are planted earlier, 
especially when it's going to go through the heat of the summer. Cowpeas are still frequently included in those mixtures when you can afford it uh, because they grow pretty well. So this is uh, sorghum sedan with cowpeas underneath. Uh, cowpeas aren't cheap, and if you want to plant 30 or 40 pounds of the acre for a solid stand, uh, it costs a few bucks, and if you want to throw it in a mixture, it's not always the cheapest thing to throw in compared to clovers or other things. So uh, we think if we could grow cowpea seed here, we might be able to do it and get a, a slightly more reasonable price for varieties that we knew would grow well in our environment. You know, just bringing up cowpeas from Texas or Mississippi, you know, how's that going to do in South Dakota? I don't know. It's hard to say. So uh, we want to find some things that we know will work and that we can produce the seed and maybe get some reasonable price and add some extra seed enterprises for uh, NPSAS members. Well, there were some doubters, and I, I completely understand why there were some doubters as to whether or not uh, we could do this. But we already knew there were some cowpeas that we could at least get to mature, whether they were going to be great for cover crops or really yield much. Anybody's guess, but we knew we could get some to mature because we'd grown them in the garden already and done this. Also, University of Minnesota had a cowpea breeding program for some years. Uh, they closed that down because there just wasn't that much interest. Um, but they released a few varieties. So it was clear this could possibly work, just maybe not with all those fabulous southern black-eyed pea varieties. We'd have to see. So we did one of uh, what's sort of become our standard mode of operation. We decided to get about 100 different varieties and do a quick screen. So uh, I don't know how many of you have ever gone to the uh, USDA Genetic Resources Information Network website. It's really fun if you're interested in different varieties because they have a database of all the varieties USDA has for all the crops around the world in their collection. Thousands and thousands and thousands of varieties of all kinds of plants. So we searched through and found about 100, so it's 96 that looked promising from all over the world. Anything that seemed like it was early blooming and maybe would stand up OK, not just all those crazy viney things. And we screened them in 2012 for, uh, I guess, our, to our credit, we did get some seeds back, and uh, as, a, uh, as a point of graciousness to the doubters, most of them didn't make seed for us. Out of uh, 96, we got ourselves about 15 or 16 that made seed that was, you know, alive. And, you know, at least 85 or 90 of them, or, you know, about 85 of them just really didn't go anywhere. I'm doing the math wrong there. Anyway, most of them just came up and they didn't even bother to bloom. You know, they're just never going to make it. Day length is wrong. Everything was goofy. It's too cold. But even late planted, we got some. And we sent those seeds down to Puerto Rico over the winter to increase so we could start doing some uh, small plot evaluations. So uh, this is what uh, the farm in western Puerto Rico looks like where they did the first grow out. It's very nice to be able to do this because otherwise it would take extra years. So having a winter nursery means you save a season every year, two grow outs every year. That's just awesome. Flights to San Juan are only 500 bucks. Yeah. <laughs> Here are the study sites where these small plot evaluations are going to take place. So Dickinson and Carrington, North Dakota, Beresford, South Dakota, and um, Gosh, I can't remember the name of the town right now. I think Arlington, perhaps, just north of Madison, Wisconsin. So university partners all around, really great folks to work with, all across the region to find out regionally, can we make cowpea work in some way? Where might it go? Um, and here's where the farm is in western Puerto Rico, if you ever get down that way. So here's our cowpea trial in 2013. I've passed, or had, had some of our friends here pass around some of the information. So you can see some of the results uh, for that trial. We had 21 varieties, I think, that year. So uh, we had a, a number of check varieties and then these other PI numbers 
for uh, the varieties from all over the world that we used. You can see the cowpeas there in July, coming along all right. Here they are in North Dakota. Looks sort of like a soybean with sort of pointy leaves. After we evaluated them, we got the data pulled together from across these different sites, uh, passed it out to the NPSAS membership, um, many of whom didn't find a, sta a big table of data all that useful, but that's just how it sometimes comes. And you just make do with what you got. So we had to choose a smaller number to set forward for the following season. So we sent about a dozen down to uh, Puerto Rico again, where Brian works. That's, that's his, his workplace. I'm quite jealous. I'd be loving to work there in January. Later in uh, spring, it looked like this. Uh, we got about 25 or 30 pounds back for each of our varieties that went out to the fields in 2014. Really good yields. Um, you can see some of the differences in color and plant shape and all. A lot of seed came back. This is uh, one of the red varieties. They vary quite a bit in color. We've got samples of most of them in the uh, FBC uh, talking lounge if you want to come by and take a peek sometime. We do have one that's, uh, it's not a black-eyed pea, it's sort of a, a purple-eyed pea, and the others have all sorts of different colors. These peas, full holes. We learned about a new kind of bug with this project, the cow pea weevil. So I get all these seeds at my house in Dickinson. So Brian ships them from Puerto Rico up to me in Dickinson. They go out in my garage where I've got some shelves. And then, you know, we go down the garage and I hear something. What the heck is that noise? It's coming from these bags. Open up this bag, shot full of bugs. Bugs are scraping out of these seeds and scraping through the plastic bag. Hundreds of these little black weevils in my garage. This is our little friend, <laughs> cowpea weevil. I got hundreds of them to sweep up. We learned that we can kill these little guys without having to spray the seed or put something horrible on there if we freeze them. So once the seed's dry, we can freeze it for a few weeks. And when the seed comes back this year, because we've got cowpeas down there right now, uh, we're going to fr freeze it for about a month and hopefully not have any more cowpea issues or cowpea weevil issues. These weevils are in the USA, the rest of the USA. Puerto Rico is, in fact, a US protectorate, so it's considered our country. Don't have to do any uh, importation documents to go back and forth. Anyway, th these guys are in California and all across the South. I expect they could be here, too, if they could overwinter. We didn't really want to bring them up here to find out, so we're going to get these guys all dead and uh, not think about it again. And once we're done with Puerto Rico, no more weevils coming in my garage. Here's Pat Carr at Steve Zwinger's field uh, during the field day at the Carrington Station this summer. Um, cowpeas grew a lot more slowly this year because it was really kind of chilly. But uh, at Carrington, anyway, uh, plants did eventually get some size to them. It looked pretty solid. That's organically managed, by the way. So when it sees Steve Zwinger, shake his hand. Uh, in Wisconsin, uh, this is what Aaron Silva's plots looked like this spring. So it's just coming along. And then later on in the summer, quite a riot of growth. So in some parts of the Midwest, cowpea looks like a pretty solid grower. Some of the varieties are really pretty. Um, you know, this is a plant grown for food, so it, there are some alternative options besides cover crops, perhaps. Um, we did see some mature just fine, even though it was so cold. Pat Carr out in Dickinson, North Dakota, really had trouble with it because although everyone likes to think it's warmer out west, it does sometimes get very much colder at night. And when things are drier, things grow more slowly, so we really struggle to grow things. And this year, he didn't get too much to mature. Most of it died before uh, maturing. So uh, a lot of things were pretty slow. 
slow to flower, uh, slow to set. Some of the plants are very compact and upright. Very interesting to see. And then uh, this one, uh, Red Ripper, which is one you can actually buy commercially from further south. In Wisconsin, it actually set seeds. But in uh, the Dakotas, it, it just grows and grows. It never sets seeds. So for a cover crop, it's awesome. But as far as one that we could produce, not so much. So it'd still be right where we're at right now. So I'm going to show you what all of our plots look like. So if you bear with me. You're going to walk through the Carrington site. And these are all organic? These are all organically grown. So um, I'm just going to cut that off because I can talk to you live. Um, <clears throat> Just introducing here the fact that we're trying to find cowpeas that we can grow as a cover crop and produce seed in the Dakotas, Wisconsin, and the rest of the upper Midwest. Some of them look pretty promising. Uh, we've been doing uh, small plot variety trials now with uh, university partners. And the purpose of the video is to walk you through the plots so you could evaluate them. So in your hands, you have the 2014-2013 table on second page which explains what data we've got. And now you can also see these. So first, gray speckled palapi from Botswana. Botswana, by the way, is southern Africa. And that's what it looks like. Not the most erect variety, not the earliest variety, but pretty growthy. OK, this next one's from South Africa. This is a thing that Steve Zwinger and I have really enjoyed about cowpeas. Some varieties just put all the pods right on the top. So you, you can tell how they're doing and how they're going to yield, because all the pods are right there for you to see. Here's one from Hungary. This one isn't quite as upright, doesn't have the pods quite as high up. Davis pea is a California variety, because California is huge for these kind of plants. It looks kind of shaggy and all yields like crazy. A much thicker, more robust plant overall. Jackson purple hull is one of the pretty ones. I think that's the one that has purple-eyed white peas. So if you see anything you like, go ahead and take notes on, on your table there. We wanted you to be able to understand what all the, all the plants have been doing along the way. This is another purple hulled one. Not quite as erect, but again, the uh, pods are way up high. Tanzania, that's in uh, East Africa. This one isn't looking quite as happy, quite as fast maturing. Matures fine further south in the region, but North Dakota is perhaps a little bit tough. India also grows some cowpeas. This variety is from India, has somewhat smallish seeds. I'm not sure. Madras, I think, is southern India. I'm not really that geographically gifted, I don't remember. But that one's really tight and upright, very compact. And a, a couple more from Botswana. Botswana is a dry place. Cowpeas do really well in hot, dry places, so you're not surprised they come from Botswana. The surprising thing is that they can grow here, too. That, that's really been interesting to see. The first one from Botswana was a lot more upright and compact. This one's a little bit hairier. Hairier, if you will, just shaggy looking. And here's Red Ripper again. Red Ripper was just, I mean, you can't even see the ground between the rows. It's just vining out all over the place, but not a flower to be seen. So we'd put this out. Yep, very good. We had put this out, hoping people would um, Help us evaluate these. We will have more field days this summer, and we hope you come. So further evaluations with cowpeas. Eight varieties are down in Puerto Rico right now, just getting planted. We should be getting that seed back uh, for a rush planting in May. In 2015, our partners will evaluate these eight varieties in the Dakotas and Wisconsin. So we will have more field days and more data, and we're going to try to figure out which are the best ones most likely to be both cover crop use and seed production for that cover crop use. 
we have more field days, another meeting in the fall. We're probably going to put out some more videos so people can help evaluate these even if they can't get to the field days because we really want farmer input all along the way to make sure we have varieties that you really want to grow. We do wonder about other aspects of this. Some of these cowpeas are looking pretty decent. Now, some of the numbers you see are, are, are pulled down a little bit because we had a lot of zeros from the Dickinson site this year for yield. But cowpea yields have been varying between 800 pounds of the acre up to about 1,500 pounds of the acre. So some of them yield pretty well. You can eat them. You can eat the leaves. You can eat the pods. You can eat the seeds. So you know maybe some of these would be good in the garden, if nothing else. And you are invited to take part all along the way. Let us know what you think. The, que the question was, uh, do we know anything about nitrogen fixation with these peas? We don't, but uh, the, uh, the Wisconsin site, Aaron Silva, has rated them for uh, nodule formation. And those ratings are included on the data sheets that we just passed out. So if you read, I, I believe uh, the rating is for a lower number has more nodules, a higher number was, was it was less good because number one was the best. But uh, yeah, some of those data are there. And all we have is preliminary data at this point. But some looked uh, pretty likely to set nodules OK. What was the row spacing for planting? These were all planted out, I think, at 30-inch rows, uh, mostly because they're experimental. Um, and for seed production, it would probably be you know, wider rows like that for organic growers. Uh, for Cover crop use, of course, would be planted a lot more tightly. How would we use the, uh, these with other crops? Well, the way farmers are using these, and we're working off of what other folks are doing, is why we decided to work on these. Uh, radish and cowpeas both are part of multi-species cover crop mixtures that are being planted all over the region. Radish, especially for uh, cool season parts of, of growth, and the cowpeas especially for for uh, the hot part of the season. So if you're planting, um, say, annual forage or some cover for going through midsummer, frequently uh, cowpeas would be a part of that sort of a mix. And if you're planting something later, uh, where it's especially going to be a graze or continued growth on into uh, as late as November, uh, radish will be part of those kind of mixtures. And if you want to grow these for the garden to eat, because both of them make really good food, um, Daikon radish gets planted late June, and you get monstrous roots to harvest in the fall. And cowpeas you'd plant uh, as soon as you're escaping the, uh, the frost, so probably early June, and pick whenever.